Ben Hodges is a retired United States Army officer who became commander of the United States Army in Europe in November 2014 and held that position for three years until retiring from the Army in January 2018. He was most recently a senior advisor to Human Rights First until 2023 and serves as NATO senior mentor for logistics. Until recently, he was also the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis, specializing in NATO, the transatlantic relationship, and international security. Welcome to Silicon Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe uh, to the channel to get alerts about the fantastic videos that are coming up. Do also add comments as well, because it really helps the videos to perform. Buy me a coffee if you like what we do. But before you do that, please check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. It's never been more important than it is now to help Ukrainians to remain resilient against Russian aggression. Ben, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you back. Well, I am grateful for the privilege, Jonathan. Well, we've discussed a lot of topics, and I think over the last two years, certain things have become clearer, but also certain moves by Western allies have, uh, albeit slowly, but but followed many of the things we were advocating and discussing uh, you know, a year, year and a half ago. Um, but at the same time, We've also got a lot of stuff wrong about Putin. We were wrong about his invasion of Georgia. We were wrong about his invasion of Crimea. And a lot of people uh, were wrong about his full-scale invasion of uh, Ukraine in 2022. My question here is, what are we still getting wrong? What rabbits can you pull out of the hat that may unfoot us or surprise us? Well, what we're still getting wrong is that we are not accepting the fact that Russia is at war with us. There are still too many good people that believe somehow that Russia is a responsible nation, that they we just really need to stop provoking them and that we need to negotiate and this will all be worked out. And this is such, in my view, a naive way to look at Vladimir Putin, but not just him, it's also the whole Russian apparatus. Um, he demonstrated that he gives not a toss for uh, international law or what other countries think about him. He only wants us all to fear him. He killed Navalny uh, during the Munich Security Conference to make sure that even though Russia was not there, they were still part of the conversation. And then, of course, he holds an election that nobody on the planet accepts as a legitimate outcome. Um, and, of course, he is um, threatening the use of nuclear weapons all the time, threatening to strike bases in NATO countries that F-16s, from which F-16s might fly into Ukraine. So uh, we need to think and act strategically and accept that Russia's at war with us and that we should be thinking about how we deal with that. Uh, now, being at war doesn't mean shooting. You know, for, I think in the West, we tend to think of your at war or not at war, meaning only kinetic, whereas the Russians use everything from threats to economic to disinformation to uh, kinetic and everything in between, depending on the circumstances. We've got to get on that same kind of a mindset. Ecoside is another incredible one there. I attended an event in 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 London recently where the Kohovka Dam ecocide was discussed, and of course the threats against the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power station. Um, and only this week, the uh, hydroelectric station has been hit and taken out of action, depriving Kharkiv of energy. Again, the scale of brutality and the actions he's prepared to take seem to wrong foot us or. Unfortunately, uh, we seem to sort of normalize many of these barbaric actions and sort of move on with relatively little coverage. Well, uh, excellent point. I mean, the things that they're doing uh, in the past normally would have brought uh, cries of outrage and calls for action. And now it's like, oh, this is just Russia. You know, what can you do about it? And 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 that's what Putin understands about us, that we really feel helpless, even though we shouldn't. I mean, the combined economies of the EU, let alone the US, UK, and Canada, the combined economies of the EU dwarf whatever Russia has. But somehow we've talked ourselves into the fact that, oh my God, Russia's on a war footing. 40% of their economy is on a war footing. <laughs> that's that's 40% of Spain's economy. 
I mean, that's what we're talking about. And so uh, we have, with all respect to our Spanish friends, but you understand what I, what I mean. And, um, you know, the, I like what you brought up about this uh, eco side. You know, the, um, there are lots of ships carrying oil from Russia through the Danish, across the Baltic Sea, through the Danish Straits, and then on out into markets. And this not only uh, generates income for Russia's war machine, uh, and the oligarchs who are making money off of all of this, but it also is a huge environmental risk for Denmark. And so if we were truly serious, if we were thinking strategically and about competing against Russia in all domains, uh, all of the countries of the EU would be putting their arms around uh, Denmark saying, go ahead, we'll support you when you, you, you invoke your right to stop these ships because of the risk of an environmental disaster that they pose, especially since they refuse to bring on board a pilot to get you through the straits. So this is an area where not only can we inflict some pain on Russia, um, but it also would create a problem for them instead of us always responding to what they do and say. And that fleet, I mean, it's an interesting point, and uh, it's a curious uh, coincidence I put that exact question to the experts in this ecocide uh, um, panel. This fleet isn't just a normal fleet, and it's not registered using the normal insurance compliance. It's a grey fleet, which doesn't conform to international codes in any way whatsoever. Do you think this is a ticking time bomb? And actually, should we be killing two birds with one stone by effectively uh, strangling Russia's ability to make money off of that while also enforcing international norms and protecting the environment? You know, I'm not a lawyer, but I think everybody knows that international law is only what the international community says it is. And so declaring something uh, a law or international agreement, but not enforcing it, uh, is pretty much what we're doing with Russia. They're allowed to violate freedom of navigation. Uh, they um, uh, thumb their nose at environmental uh, regulations and agreements. And clearly, uh, it's extremely dangerous what they're doing, having ships that are known to be uh, either, I won't say unseaworthy, but that they are not, nobody should have confidence. There's a reason most of them are not actually properly insured. Uh, and the fact that they will not take on a pilot, a Danish pilot, to get through the straits is, again, it shows a total lack of respect for international norms and agreements. And as long as we don't do anything about it, the Russians are going to keep doing whatever they want. And going back to this uh, phrase you mentioned of a certain complacency, um, here's, here's the provocative question. We are, and many experts I speak to, confidently state that, that NATO is, is, is an incredible success. Uh, Article 5 is an incredible success, and Russia has not invaded any uh, countries that are covered by that. The threat is to Moldova and others that come outside of the Article 5 um, sort of agreement. Having said that, there are rumors of Russian troops being uh, amassed next to the Suwalki Gap. And there are a speech just last week, which uh, Lukashenko was uh, in conversation with his generals, uh, clearly talking about sort of provocations and military action uh, around the Baltics. Have we lulled ourselves into thinking that, you know, mutually assured destruction, Article 5, we're OK, actually, because we're covered by these and could this be one area where Putin springs yet another surprise? Well, uh, of course, it should not be a surprise because we've been talking about these things that you just described uh, ad nauseum uh, for the last few years. So nobody should be surprised, although I predict we will be surprised because there are still too many people that have their head in the sand and don't want to have to address the reality. Because if you if you acknowledge the threat, then you're obligated to do something about it. And as you know, right there in the UK, um, countries, uh, the, the government's having a hard time coming up with a budget that provides the security that UK needs versus what it can afford. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that there are Russian troops massing near the Suwalki Corridor, uh, but certainly this is the place, in my view, it would be one of the most likely places where they might attempt to do something um, and then to create this so-called escalate to de-escalate situation where they 
seize a part of, of Lithuania, for example, and then turn to us and say, do you really want to get into a nuclear war over a little bit of Lithuania? And by the way, it's our right to connect, uh, you know, to Kaliningrad and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that what Lukashenko is doing, of course, this is part of the theater. I mean, uh, his his army could not uh, defeat his police force. I mean, that, that it really is. Uh, there's a reason they haven't been involved in the fight on, on the side of the Russians against Ukraine, because he knows they would all be destroyed uh, in early days. Uh, so I think this is a little bit of theater for him uh, to uh, perhaps it's the audience he intends to reach is Russia there to show that, hey, I'm still on board, uh, but keep some distance. Or maybe it's intended for a domestic audience. I can't tell, but I, I seriously doubt that his forces are much of a threat to anybody. Nonetheless, that geography is what it is. And so Lithuania, Poland, uh, Germany, and the U.S. in particular, which have the closest NATO enhanced forward presence battle groups, you know, you, ha you have to practice, you have to exercise, you have to be ready. And uh, Germany agreeing to having a full arm uh, brigade combat team there in Lithuania within a couple more years, that's a big deal. Uh, and, and I think they're going to deliver on that. And uh, let's turn to the revolution that we're seeing in the air and sea war. Since we last spoke, there's been an extraordinary uh, extension of Ukraine's capabilities to threaten Russia air supremacy. And we're seeing now, I think we're up to a third of the Black Sea fleet, uh, essentially promoted to submarine class. Um, what what else are we going to see here? And uh, you know, how has Ukraine been able to develop these extraordinary capabilities? It really is impressive. Um, they have changed the character of naval warfare, at least for enclosed areas like the Black Sea or the Baltic Sea. And, and I think uh, all of us, all of our navies are watching closely um, the vulnerabilities that Ukrainians have been able to exploit. And um, the, the fact that they've done this with a clever blend of new technologies, adapted technologies, sabotage special forces uh, versus a traditional ship on ship type of, of combat. I think this also points to the lack of readiness and capability of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. I mean, they they were no better than the Russian army in the early days of this of this conflict. And they've really been exposed now uh, to the point that they are almost a, a non-factor. It certainly seems that way. And the Ukrainians also have cleverly uh, gone after the LSTs, the landing ships tank, um, which are the larger vessels that could also be used to move logistics across Azov Sea, for example, uh, if the Kerch Bridge is destroyed or, or unusable. So, um, smart targeting by the Ukrainians going after the logistics, just like going after the dry dock in Sevastopol. I mean, I'm not a Navy guy, but even I know that if you don't have your dry dock, you can't do significant maintenance. And so they're having to shift further east. Um, I think much of what has happened in the Black Sea will be applicable in the Baltic Sea as well. Uh, I don't see the U.S. Navy or the Royal Navy, for example, sending capital ships up into the Baltic Sea uh, but there's there's not a need to do that um, if you've got uh, maritime unmanned systems out there doing uh, doing things. Um, so I, I think the Ukrainians have found a way since the the land operations are uh, probably going to remain relatively stabilized for the next many months. This is one of the ways they're able to keep pressure on Russia. They've also been able to take out a number of ships that were protecting the Kerch Bridge against drones. Is it possible to say at this point that the siege of Crimea has begun and we could well see further attacks on not just logistics, uh, bringing supplies via the Crimean Peninsula, but the final destruction of the bridge? In fact, it's been admitted in Russia they're no longer actually sending military supplies across the bridge because of past attacks and because of the likelihood of future ones. I think I, I like your phrasing uh, that this is the siege of uh, of Crimea. And 
Um, you know, that this is an enormous structure. This, this bridge is an enormous structure. And and so it's going to take more than a couple of storm shadows or Taurus to uh, to drop it. I think it's going to take a lot of um, well-placed uh, explosives delivered by some means uh, and probably a lot. And, and of course, it'll be part of a larger operation involving deception and misdirection and um uh, I think you know Ukrainians who have, have demonstrated a, a level of cleverness um, and savvy that's as good as any in the world over the last couple of years. So they, I'm pretty sure that they've got a, a plan in the works uh, on how they're going to do this, and the and when the time is right, and and they are confident that they can do it. But doing things like what you described, knocking out, uh, reducing the ability of the of the Russian Black Sea Fleet to protect the bridge is part of it. Um, going after air defenses in the area is part of it. Um, partisan networks, this is all part of it. And of course, the Russians realize their vulnerability. That's why they improved or developed this railroad that runs through Donbass uh, that can still bring some logistics to Russian troops in the southern uh, Zaporizhia and Kherson regions. Um, but of course, a railroad there is also going to be vulnerable. And needless to say, attack is never more important to take this stuff out. Um, but we, we've covered that one. Something else we covered in the very first episode, because I've just been sort of transcribing and looking through it. We discussed escalation management uh, way back a year and a half in that first uh, interview. You also very clearly um, made the point that uh, retaking Crimea was pivotal to achieving a victory over Putin. In recent uh, events that I've been part of in, in Berlin, Paris, and so on, I get the distinct impression that there is queasiness around the idea in Paris, uh, maybe less so in Paris now, but certainly in Berlin and Washington, about the idea of Ukraine retaking Donbass and especially retaking Crimea. Is it now clearer that Ukraine is not being supplied to retake these territories, but is being supplied to essentially freeze the lines of contact, maybe go up to Mariupol or wherever, but there is a certain disquiet about them going further. I, I think you could uh, definitely draw that conclusion. Uh, I haven't start, heard it stated quite that way, but I think based on what we see and what we don't see and what we hear and what we don't hear, you could come away from, with a... Uh, with that conclusion. Uh, the fact that the administration, uh, which has done a lot over the past couple of years, but they still have stopped short of their most important task, which is to clearly identify the strategic objective and to lay out the strategic priorities. Um, you know, they have not said, we want Ukraine to win. Uh, and I do think that they're, they have allowed Putin to create some sort of mystical uh, properties about Crimea that, oh my God, if Ukraine gets that, He's going to use everything he has, including nuclear weapons, which I think is nonsensical. But unfortunately, there's enough people that believe that. I mean, if it was so important, then, then why is a third of the Black Sea Fleet underwater and the rest of the Black Sea Fleet is leaving? Because they can't they can't stop it. Um, and, and why uh, aren't they uh, fighting like crazy in the Black Sea to regain control over the water that they've lost? Because they can't. And so the idea that they would somehow use a nuclear weapon is to me, uh, look, I, I don't mean to sound so dismissive of it. Of course, you have to take it serious. They have thousands of nuclear weapons. They don't care how many innocent people are killed. But I think even the Russians realize they, there are zero upsides for them to use a nuclear weapon. And their nuclear weapons are really most effective when they don't use them because they see how we, exactly what you just described, we're not willing to help Ukraine take Crimea because we're worried that the Russians might use a nuclear weapon. So uh, we've, we've got to get over that mental block. And you're no longer in the military and you're able to uh, articulate these things in, in a clear manner. What are the challenges, though, for someone who is still serving potentially and can see what the military strategy would dictate and yet is really serving uh, a civilian administration who is perhaps more led by a managerial mindset as opposed to a leadership mindset. How do you get these ideas across, uh, sometimes against fierce resistance or even in a circumstance where 
you perceive that a policy is is incorrect and strategically could lead to failure. Okay, so three or four very important points you've raised uh, right here. Number one, obviously, you know, in our democratic societies, we the, the military works for the civilian leadership, and so um, in the U.S., you know, your oath is to the Constitution and. Uh, officers in the uh, British military and the French and German and so on, you know, it's our duty to carry out the lawful orders of our civilian leaders. Um, and it's not appropriate for uh, officers to be uh, arguing against policy, certainly in public. That, that would be entirely inappropriate. However, uh, it is the duty of officers to give their best professional military advice to the civilian leadership and say, look, this is this is uh, what we need to do. This is going to be the cost. This is the cost of failure. Here's the risk. If we don't do it, we're going to have to do this. And to be very, very blunt. Um, and usually, um, unless you're, you know, you deal with it all the time, a civilian leadership will not appreciate the amount of time required or the, the expense or uh, the different sort of factors associated with this. And to include the cost of failure. So this is where professional military leaders um, and defense, Ministry of Defense civil servants have to lay out in very cold facts, no, no emotion, dot, dot, dot. Um, and, and especially the time, this is how long it will take to do certain things. Now, um, of course, at the end of the day, when the prime minister or the president or the secretary or the minister of defense says, thanks for your input, no, this is what we're going to do, well, then you salute and you carry it out as if it was your own idea. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't be um, doing everything you can to learn from what we're seeing, uh, Mac, uh, going to the fullest extent of what is allowed in terms of providing uh, aid, uh, making sure that we're giving the Ukrainians everything we possibly can within the constraints of the policy. I would never advocate for anybody in uniform to intentionally go around or undermine their civilian leadership. That's, I mean, then we're no better than uh, the other guys. Yep. And what's interesting, I think, is one of the results of the political impasse, of course, has been a so-called ammunition famine. Uh, over the last couple of months, that does seem to be easing in certain areas of the front with uh, initiatives like the one uh, of the Czech president and his diplomats and um, a ramping up of, of uh, European uh, production of 155 millimeter shells. Despite this, and this I think, you know, uh, keen to see if you're, you know, share this. The extraordinary story is despite the ammunition famine, um, Ukraine has been able to consolidate around defensive positions. And in some places, those defensive positions are fairly shallow and weak. Nonetheless, they've held the Russians at bay despite extraordinarily fierce uh, you know, massed assaults. How is Ukraine able to create these possibilities even when they're not getting the equipment they need? So once again, uh, Jonathan, you you really should have your own podcast. I mean, th these are excellent questions. <laughs> um, you know, in a war, there's there's two sides. I mean, we all we focus on the Ukrainian side. Oh my God, they're running out of ammunition. They've suffered casualties. It's, it's looking bleak. They lost Avdivka. Five weeks ago was when Avdivka fell. The Russians were not able to exploit that because they don't have the ability to. I mean, they are. You know, the other side is in real trouble. They, they, I think they are in big trouble from a manpower standpoint. I mean, about every two months, they'll announce a, a huge 300,000 people call up. It doesn't happen. They, they don't do it. Um, they have lost so many people. They don't have the ability to train 300,000 new people or they've they've built two new guards, tank armies. BS. These They're announced, but they don't exist or they certainly are not combat formations yet. Now, um, I think their ammunition, you know, this number has been out there so many times that it's taken as taken for granted as a law of nature that they've got 10 to 1 or 5 to 1 advantage on artillery shells. That's probably true in certain places. But if you don't have the ability to exploit or use that, um, they have lost so many of their experienced officers and, and sergeants. So I would just say um, that... Uh, 
war is not just about math and who's got the most people. I mean, we lost in Vietnam, we lost in Afghanistan. So um, I, I think that uh, Ukrainians are, are defending their homeland and they know the terrain better than anybody. And uh, the Russians are uh, the occupiers. They're the invaders. And I don't think you could fill up a school bus with Russian soldiers that actually want to be there. And there's an interesting focus there, which leads on what you're saying. Ukraine seems to make incredible investments in precision munitions. We see FPV drones and others um, increasing in accuracy, increasing in capability. On the other side, Russia is developing ever larger glide bombs. But essentially, they're a bit like the V1s and V2s in the last stages of the Second World War. They're weapons of mass terror, mass destruction to be used ultimately against civilian targets. Um do you see these these alternative sort of approaches there? And, um, you know, this eventually will lead Russia to 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 lose because they're not investing in precision capability. So uh, this is this is a tough question. Um, they certainly when I talk to my Ukrainian friends, they talk about the overwhelming advantage that Russia has in drones and in electronic warfare. So, I mean, there is there is a. Uh, a challenge for Ukraine in that regard, um, and these these czar bombs that are, that are being talked about, um, I mean that that is going to cause a problem. Uh, certainly, they'll be used uh, against civilian targets, uh, against power grids, against infrastructure. Um, but bombing by itself, I mean, we know from World War II where you know all sides tried strategic bombing, and none of that was ever going to bring about the end of the war uh, by itself. So well, we obviously had to figure out ways to help Ukraine uh, protect their, their civilian infrastructure from these things, uh, as well as get at the source somehow before these things ever take off. What, what can we do to help Ukraine uh, attack air bases from which these things are, are, are being delivered. I, I think that's part of what we can do to help. And of course, the story has been put around. There are many arguments as to whether it's actually true or not, but that the US and Berlin are not happy at Ukraine's strategy of hitting uh, fuel refining capabilities in Russia. The argument has been put that's going to drive up oil uh, prices, crude prices, but that seems to be illogical because you're not hitting the crude supply, you're, you're hitting internal fuel oil production uh, for the war effort. Um, how much veracity did you put on this idea that the US is not happy at that strategy and also at the insurgency that is taking place, which essentially are Russian troops, but very much under the guidance of Ukraine, who are in Belgorod and Kursk oblasts? So uh, when I read that, the Financial Times report uh, about supposedly the administration had told Ukraine to knock off the attacks on the, I was I was furious. And, I, and then I thought, okay, even though it's in Financial Times, this can't be true. I mean, it's such a terrible, disgusting uh, policy uh, by the U.S. I said, please tell me this is not true. Unfortunately, it appears it was true. And, and unfortunately, it's it's believable that it's true. Um, and, and I think uh, I, stopping, stopping the attacks on Russian oil and gas infrastructure at the same time that the Russians are destroying Ukraine's infrastructure. I mean, it's a what a cruel joke. Uh, and, and of course, it comes across as being only for the self-interest of the American politics, which is the other reason that the uh, um, uh, the aid packages have been stopped because of U.S. domestic politics. And this, for me, as an American, is embarrassing, and it shows a lack of uh, strategic um, prioritization and understanding, and we've lost our way. I, I, I do. I don't understand it. And of course, uh, the Chinese watch this, the Iranians watch this, all of our other adversaries watch this. And uh, I, I, I hope that the administration comes out quickly and says, hey, that wasn't us. That was what we meant to say was. Uh, but I, I don't get any hints that that's coming out. 
It's curious, isn't it? Because, uh, I mean, not all lawyers are, have the leadership capability of Abraham Lincoln, um, but it did seem that, that, that Jake Sullivan rushed to Kiev. Um, it was an unannounced trip, and we don't quite know what was discussed in that trip, but it very much comes in the wake of these oil refinery hits. One could perhaps put two and two together, and that gives perhaps some credibility to, to that story we were discussing. Yeah, well, I hope the Ukrainians will ignore this. I mean, they're not, it's not like they're depending on U.S. weapons to, uh, to do it. They haven't received much from the U.S. in the last several months anyway. Um, and I think uh, Deputy Prime Minister Stefana Shina, she said, hey, this, this is a legitimate target. And, uh, and we're going to continue to defend our country. And that's, that's exactly what they should be doing. And of course, it gives the signal to Vladimir Putin that he can act with impunity. And even though there are supposedly hundreds of thousands of Russian dead, many, many times more, even in just the FDV offensive than they experienced in Afghanistan, there seems to be no limit to what Putin is prepared to sacrifice, just as there are no limits to his power, no limits to the amount of time he will be spending in office after the election. Could we be seeing easily a million plus dead Russians by the end of the year? And is there any stopping Putin? Well, if it's if it's based on his willingness to spend other people's lives, especially if they're from the outer ethnic regions of the Russian Federation, then yes, you're right. Um, at some point, I mean, just imagine if we, uh, the West, got serious about sanctions and got serious about shutting down all the ways that Russia is able to keep their war machine going. If we got really serious about that, um, and then you've got oligarchs and people that are no kidding. I mean, they are really suffering financially. I mean, they're, they're feeling it. Um, then I think it becomes uh, Putin's uh, freedom of maneuver uh, be becomes a little bit more restricted. Um, I don't en envision the uh, Russian people are going to rise up and say no more. Although I was impressed with how many people turned up at Navalny's uh, funeral. Um, that was that was impressive. Um, you know, this whole terrorist attack at the Crocus uh, Theater uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, how desperately the Kremlin has tried to pin this on Ukraine somehow um, is in desperate is is the word. I mean, I think they are desperate looking for something to protect the image of Putin as able to protect his people, which obviously he can't do uh, because they've got so much focus elsewhere. I don't think the FSB is quite the uh, razor sharp organization it used to be back in, in the day. And, uh, you know, there's there's some cracks out there that we should be clever in exploitation, and I don't I don't know that we're doing that. And to pick up on that point, do you sense that there is a dearth of creativity, imagination, a willingness to create opportunities on our side? I mean, we look at that uh, initiative by the Czech government we mentioned a minute ago. That's an extraordinary initiative, which is having a very real and beneficial impact on Ukraine. But really, it's it's one man, a diplomat, who came up with the idea and, and, and found, obviously, a political leader to champion it. Where are the other plans? Where are the other consortia to, you know, log equipment around the world, whether it be equipment that is set for scrap or is, uh, you know, about to be expired? Why aren't governments uh, and, dare I say, it, bureaucrats being more proactive in just scraping together everything we can or even, you know, creating consortia or installations to um, re re refurbish equipment from around the world? We seem to be incredibly slow and incapable of this creative thinking. Yeah, because we don't have a strategic objective. Look, uh, I'm going to share some, tell you something that you already know. Uh, January or December 1941, Japanese had just bombed Pearl Harbor. Great Britain has been through almost three years of end-to-end -end disasters. Uh, and Churchill comes to Washington, meets with Roosevelt. They spend Christmas. And then they have the Arcadia Conference in January 42. Uh, no Americans or most Americans did not want to get into a war in Europe uh, against Germany, although they were obviously hot to fight against Japan. Uh, Neither the Americans or Great Britain had optimism, reason for optimism. But these two leaders sat down and said, Germany first. 
we're going to de defeat Germany first, uh, and we're going to combine our staffs so that we can figure out how to do this. So a strategic priority uh, that required political courage by Roosevelt, because again, it was going to be Germany first, not Japan, but they understood that if they didn't defeat Germany first, number one, Great Britain might not be around, uh, and then it would be very difficult to get into the continent, and then we wouldn't be able to turn all of our assets towards the destruction of Japan. And then one year later, January 1943, the Casablanca Conference, Churchill and Roosevelt meet together again, and they come up with the strategic end state, unconditional surrender. Not this nonsense of we want to fight to get to a better negotiating position against Hitler or the emperor of Japan, unconditional surrender. We're going to crush it. We're going to destroy them. So here you have two leaders with clarity of strategic objective and clarity of strategic priority. Again, at a time when there was no reason for real optimism, and they're able to explain to the populations, okay, Ford Motor Company, you're, nobody's going to be buying cars for the next three years. You're going to be making Jeeps and trucks. And, and, and we got mobilized in terms of industry, and we raised huge armies, navies, and air forces, and it, we won the war. That's, that's what's missing now. We don't have that clarity of strategic end state and strategic priority, and therefore industries don't get mobilized, populations don't get mobilized, we need that sort of clarity. And in terms of the immediacy of requirements, does it make more sense at this point? Yes, those production lines need to be uh, reinstated or built from scratch in some cases, but there are also a lot of munitions around the world um, that are in this period of, you know, expiry. Um, and uh, really, you know, they're, they're, they're going for scrap uh, without anyone thinking about whether that could change. If you were in charge, how would you go about this? How would you go about identifying what's out there and what would be required to refurbish and ship it? And of course, the financing in place. I'm thinking in particular, I've got a bit of a shopping list here, uh, supposedly 2,800 Bradleys uh, in storage, um, which is, I think, about sort of 30, 40 percent of the total number in the U.S., um, and these look like they're going to be stored until they're scrapped. You've got Challenger 1s in Oman, Challenger 2 tanks are going to be scrapped, um, while others are going to be upgraded to the next uh, the next sort of iteration of those. Uh, you've got Tranche 1 Eurofighters, Taipans, A-10 Warthogs, apparently 58 units set for scrap. Um, and the list goes on. There are Patriots that are close to their expiry date, but we know that Ukraine needs Patriots desperately. Uh, and then, of course, there's the F-16s that at the moment are going to be supplied, if they ever are, in numbers that, that may not make a, a huge difference. If you're in charge, what would you do to try and log and, and get this stuff to Ukraine with a sense of immediacy? Well, uh, at the risk of sounding like a scratch record, of course, you have to have uh, a strategic objective. What, what is our desired strategic end state? You know, we spent 20 years in Afghanistan and did not have a clearly identified end state except for the first year. Then 19 years, we were in search of policies about, you know, schools, girls' rights, uh, cap, force cap, you know, blah, 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 um, without having an end state. And so you cannot possibly develop good policy without having a strategic end state that's clearly identified. So that, I, I want to keep emphasizing that. If you have that, then you turn to your Minister, Secretary of Defense or Minister of Defense and say, hey, I don't care what it costs. You get them. They need the ability to do this and this and this empty the warehouse, everything that we have, get it to them. And then, and then it happens. But without that kind of clarity, then, you know, you're going to run into good, well-intentioned people that say, um, uh, you know, uh, it's a, we got to change the law here and this, and, and there's a million reasons why not. And the Pentagon, which is loaded with really good, hardworking people, um, I served there three times. I mean, they weren't like dogs there. It is the most conservative place on the planet. And that's conservative with a small C because their job is to make sure that they never fail a task for the United States. So they're never going to take risks like, um, you know, if we give these up, then we don't have any. And um, so that's that's part of it. Now, uh, I think it's also important to keep in mind when you talk about here's 2000 Bradley fighting vehicles that have been sitting out in the desert. Right? They have not been sitting in climate controlled environment. They have not had any maintenance in years. So the fact is, probably 
uh, at some significant cost, some of them could, in fact, be brought back to life and provided to the Ukrainians. But that, you know, that's, that's time and that's money. So is that time and money best spent there? Or do we focus on what do they really need, which is, of course, as you talked about, um, air and missile defense capabilities, uh, long-range precision strike capabilities, ammunition. Um, that's that's where I would uh, would put a focus, is to get those capabilities there. Um, finally, I, I just heard that the, uh, you know, we have one factor that makes the Javelin and Hellfire and the uh, the GMLRS rocket that come off of the ATACM, or the, uh, well, ATACMs. Um, it's one place that makes them. And of course, you know, there's one company that makes the little rocket motor for all of them. So this um, this is an area where I would be pouring a lot of money into to say, okay, well, let's triple that now. I mean, what will it take? Just tell me, I'll write the check. Yeah, and that requires will and strategy. Let's pick up on that because the strategy seems to be uh, risk management uh, to enforce a kind of illusory status quo in the belief that that is you know, going to prevent X, Y, and Z from happening. Again, these are all assumptions. They are not uh, facts. Um, but it seems as we go on and Putin's regime becomes ever more toxic, on the one hand, the Ukrainian price of victory, whenever it comes in, you know, this year, next year, or 2026, the price of that victory will be far, far higher than if it was achieved in 2022. But also the systemic instability in Russia uh, and the degradation of whatever vestige it had of civil society is being eroded. So not if, but when it eventually collapses, that will be far more catastrophic Um than if Ukraine was able to achieve a speedy victory. So would you class this strategy? I mean, I'm almost thinking it as a kind of equilibrium appeasement. Are you classing this actually not a low risk strategy, but actually as an extremely high risk strategy, which has just elongated and elongated this, this conflict out to the point now where the, the, the end result could be extraordinarily risky? If we were thinking strategically, we would connect Russia, Iran, and their proxies, uh, North Korea, and China. And then just like Churchill and Roosevelt said Germany first, we say Russia first. If, if we help Ukraine defeat Russia, then Iran, which is Russia's best ally and vice versa, is isolated. Uh, they're not getting anything from Russia. They got nobody to help them. And uh, and then there, the Iranians are less capable of giving weapons and support to the Houthis, Hamas, and Hezbollah. Uh, and then the Chinese are saying, huh, okay, well, the West is serious about protecting in, uh, the things they say they care about, sovereignty, freedom of navigation, uh, international agreements, and so on. So to me, strategically, the sooner that we can help Ukraine defeat Russia, the sooner Iran becomes isolated and China is dissuaded from making a terrible miscalculation. Um, but that means we've got to have people who have a career vested in Russia, some great power, uh, to start talking in terms of exactly what, the, I like the way you described it. It's inevitable. I mean, Russia, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union continues to this day, and it is, uh, because it's built on a rotten foundation, it's going to collapse. Uh, the sooner that happens, the better for all of us, but, but we should not be scared to think about what does that mean? We were not prepared. I was not prepared uh, for the collapse of the Soviet Union. I haven't met too many people that in 1988 said, next year's the year. Okay, I think we should, we should anticipate this and be prepared for that. That's incredibly important. I mean, you highlight something here, which is it's not just increasing the risk in the Russia-Eurasian continent. You're highlighting there that actually global risk uh, is being uh, massively um, put, you know, threatened by our um, lack of a strategy and lack of action? Well, um, I think the Chinese um, are encouraged by our failure to, uh, to to mobilize, to, to, and when I say mobilize, I don't mean in the old sense of calling up all your reserves and reinstall, reinstituting conscription or whatever, but you know, getting in the mindset and prioritizing 
our, our industries. And of course, these industries are not charity. I mean, they, they have thousands of employees, complex supply chains. Uh, but you use the word uh, accountability earlier, which I like. Um, it, when, uh, during the Munich Security Conference in February, I was talking to a gentleman, let's just say he worked for an agency that is directly associated with the responsibility of finding the million rounds that the EU promised. And he told me they were having huge difficulty because nations do not want to talk about what they have. So there's a lack of transparency there for their own security reasons. And companies were reluctant to uh, say what they could make for proprietary reasons. So really, what we don't know what, what's out there. And then like five days later, President Pavel said, oh, I just found a source for 800,000 rounds. And then a couple of weeks later, it's actually one and a half million rounds. And now people are discovering that Turkey can make enormous amounts of ammunition. And so um, I will predict that by the end of this year, there are going to be mountains of ammunition uh, that are being uh, produced, delivered, and we'll be in a, we'll be in a different place. But it, it has taken uh, the wake up call and political leaders start poking a stick into, hey, what do you have? I mean, what what's out there? And when President Pavel not surprising that the former chairman of the military committee at NATO would have an idea where some ammunition might be. You know, I think there's a dozen other countries got into a queue saying, we'll help pay for it. That's extraordinary. And, and we can only hope that we see more of those initiatives. Well, we didn't cover the U.S. election. I think we'll save that one for the next conversation. That's a can of worms as well. Um but it does sound like there are reasons to potentially be optimistic from our discussion today. And of course, I know everyone watching the channel will be immensely grateful, uh, not just for your appearance here, but for the time you spend in talking to so many people who are uh, you know, trying to uh, fight the case for supporting Ukraine. Thank you very much for the privilege, Jonathan.